Marmion by Sir Walter Scott. Canto Sixth, The Battle. While great events were on the gate, and each hour brought a varying tale, and the demeanor changed and cold of Douglas fretted Marmion bold, and like the impatient seed of war he snuffed the battle from afar, and hopes were none that back again Harold should come from Tyrone, where England's king in leaguer lay before decisive battle day. Whilst these things were, the mournful Clare did in the dame's devotions share, for the good countess ceaseless prayed to heaven and the saints, her sons to aid. And, with short interval, did pass from prayer to book, from book to mass, and all in high baronial pride, a life both dull and dignified. Yet, as Lord Marmion nothing pressed upon her intervals of rest, dejected Clara well could bear the formal state, the lengthened prayer, though dearest to her wounded heart the hours that she might spend apart. I said, Tantalon's dizzy steep hung o'er the margin of the deep. Many a rude tower and rampart there repelled the insult of the air, which, when the tempest vexed the sky, half breeze, half spray came whistling by. Above the rest, a tourist square did o'er its gothic entrance bear, of sculpture rude, a stony shield. The bloody heart was in the field, and in the chief three mullets stood, the cognizance of Douglas blood. The turret held a narrow stair, which, mounted, gave you access where a parapet's embattled row did seaward round the castle go, sometimes in dizzy steps, descending, sometimes in narrow circuit bending, sometimes in platform broad extending, its varying circle did combine bulwark and bartison and line, and bastion tower and vantage coin, above the booming ocean lent the far projecting battlement. The billows burst in ceaseless flow upon the precipice below. Where'er Tantalon faced the land, gateworks and walls were strongly manned. No need upon the sea girt side, the steepy rock, the frantic tide, approach of human step denied, and thus these lines and rampart rude were left in deepest solitude. And, for they were so lonely, Clare would to these battlements repair, and muse upon her sorrows there and list the seabird's cry, or slow, like noontide ghost, would glide along the dark gray bulwark's side, and ever on the heaving tide look down with weary eye. Oft did the cliff in swelling main recall the thoughts of Whitby's fane, a home she ne'er might see again, for she had lain adown, so Douglas bade, the hood and veil, and frontlet of the cloister pale, and Benedictine gown. It were unseemly sight, he said, a novice out of Kemvent shade. Now her bright locks, with sunny glow, again adorned her brow of snow, her mantle rich, whose borders, round, a deep and fretted broidery bound, in golden foldings sought the ground, of holy ornament. Alone remained a cross with ruby stone, and often did she look on that which in her hand she bore, with velvet bound, embroidered o'er, her breviary book. In such a place, so lone, so grim, at dawning pale, or twilight dim, if fearful would have been to meet a form so richly dressed, with book in hand, and cross on breast, and such a woeful mien. Fitz Eustace, loitering with his bow, to practice on the gull and crow, saw her, at distance, gliding slow, and did by Mary swear, some lovelorn fay she might have been, or, in romance, some spellbound queen, for ne'er in workday world was seen a form so witching fair. Once walking thus at evening tide, it chanced a gliding sail she spied, and sighing thought, The abbess, there, perchance does to her home repair. Her peaceful rule, where duty free, walks hand in hand with charity, where oft devotions tranced glow, can such a simple glimpse of heaven bestow, that the enraptured sisters see high vision and deep mystery, the very form of Hilda fair, hovering upon the sunny air, and smiling on her votary's prayer. Oh, wherefore to my duller eye did still the saint her form deny? Was it that, seared by sinful scorn, my heart could neither melt nor burn? Or lie my warm affections low with him that taught them first to glow? Yet, gentle abbess, 
well I knew to pay the kindness grateful due, and well could brook the mild command that ruled the simple maiden band. How different now, condemned to bide my doom from this dark tyrant's pride. But Marmion has to learn, ere long, that constant mind and hate of wrong descended to a feeble girl, from red to clare, stout Gloucester's earl, of such a stem, a sapling weak, he ne'er shall bend, although he break. But see, what makes this armor here? For in her path there lay, targe, corslet, helm, she viewed them near, the breastplate pierced. Ay, much I fear, weak fence wert thou gainst foeman's spear. What that hath made fatal entrance here, as thy dark blood gouts say? Thus Wilton, oh, no, corslet's ward, not truth, as diamond pure and hard, could be thy manly bosom's guard on yon disastrous day. She raised her eyes in mournful mood. Wilton himself before her stood. It might have seemed his passing ghost, for every youthful grace was lost, and joy unwanted, and surprise, gave their strange wildness to his eyes. Expect not, noble dames and lords, that I can tell such scene in words. What skillful limner e'er would choose to paint the rainbow's varying hues, unless to mortal it were given to dip his brush in dyes of heaven? Far less can my weak line declare each changing passion's shade, brightening to rapture from despair, sorrow, surprise, and pity there, and joy with her angelic air, and hope that paints the future fair, their varying hues displayed, each o'er its rival's ground extending, alternate conquering, shifting, blending, till all fatigued the conflict yield, and mighty love retains the field. Shortly I tell what then he said, but many a tender word was delayed, and Ma's blush, and bursting sigh, and question kind, and fond reply. The Wilton's History Forget we that disastrous day, when senseless in the lists I lay, thence dragged, but how I cannot know, for sense and recollection fled, I found me on a pallet low, within my ancient beadsman's shed. Austin, rememberst thou, my Clare, how thou didst blush when the old man, when first our infant love began, said we would make a matchless pair? Menials and friends and kinsmen fled from the degraded traitor's bed. He only held my burning head and tended me for many a day, while wounds and fever held their sway. But far more needful was his care when sense returned to wake despair, for I did tear the closing wound and dashed me frantic on the ground, if e'er I heard the name of Clare. At length, to calmer reason brought much by his kind attendance wrought, with him I left my native strand, and, in a palmer's weeds arrayed my hated name and form to shade, I journeyed many a land. No more a lord of rank and birth, but mingled with the dregs of earth. Oft Austin, for my reason feared, when I was sit, and deeply brood on dark revenge and deeds of blood, or wild mad schemes upreared. My friend at length fell sick, and said, God would remove him soon, and well upon his dying bed he bed of, begged of me a boon. If e'er my deadliest enemy beneath my brand should conquered lie, even then my mercy should awake, and spare his life for Austin's sake. Still, Restless as a second cane, to Scotland next my route was taken, full well the paths I knew. Frame of my fate made various sound, that death in pilgrimage I found, that I had perished of my wound. None cared which tale was true, and living eye could never guess the Wilton in his palmer's dress. For now that sable slough is shed, and trimmed my shaggy beard and head, I scarcely know me in the glass. A chance most wondrous did provide that I should be the baron's guide. I will not name his name. Vengeance to God alone belongs. But when I think on all my wrongs, my blood is liquid flame. And ne'er the time shall I forget when in a Scottish hostel set dark looks we did exchange. What were his thoughts? I cannot tell. But in my bosom mustered hell its plans of dark revenge. A word of vulgar augury that broke from me, I scarce knew why, 
brought on a village tale, which wrought upon his moody sprite, and sent him armed forth by night. I borrowed steed and mail, and weapons from his sleeping band, and, passing from a postern door, we met, and countered hand to hand. He fell on Gifford Moor. For the death stroke my brand I drew. Oh, then my helmed head he knew, the palmer's cowl gone. Then had three inches of my blade, the heavy debt of vengeance paid. My hand, the thought of Austin stayed. I left him there, alone. Oh, good old man, even from the grave thy spirit could thy master save. If I had slain my foeman, ne'er had Whitby's abbess, in her fear, given to my hand this package dear, of power to clear my injured fame, and vindicate de Wilton's name. Perchance you heard the abbess tell of the strange pageantry of hell that broke our secret speech? It rose from the infernal shade, or felty was some juggle played, a tale of peace to teach. Appeal to heaven I judged was best, when my name came among the rest." Now here, within Tantalon hold, to Douglas late my tale I told, to whom my house was known of old. Won by my proofs, his falchion bright, this eve anew shall dub me knight. These were the alms that once did turn the tide of fight to Otterburn, and Harry Hotspur forced to yield when the dead Douglas won the field. These Angus gave his armorer's care, ere morn shall every breach repair, for naught, he said, was in his halls, but ancient armor on the walls, and aged chargers in the stalls, and women, priests, and gray-haired men, the rest were all in Twistle Glen, and now I watch my armor here, by law of arms, till midnight near, then once again a belted knight seeks Surrey's camp with dawn of light." There soon again we meet, my Clare. This baron means to guide thee there. Douglas reveres his king's command, else would he take thee from his band. And there thy kinsman, Surrey, too, will give de Wilton justice due. Now meet her far for martial broil, firmer my limbs, and strung by toil, once more. O Wilton, must we then risk newfound happiness again, trust fate of arms once more? And is there not a humble glen where we, content and poor, might build a cottage in the shade, a shepherd thou, and I to aid thy task on Dale and Moor? That reddening brow, too well I know, not even thy Clare can peace bestow, while falsehood stains thy name. Go then to fight, Clare bids thee go. Clare can a warrior's feelings know, and weep a warrior's shame. Can red Earl Gilbert's spirit feel? Buckle the spurs upon thy heel, and belt thee with thy brand of steel, and send thee forth to fame. That night, upon the rocks and bay, the midnight moonbeam slumbering lay, and poured its silver light and pure through loophole and through embrasure upon Tantalon Hall and Tower. But chief were arched windows wide, illuminate the chapel's pride, the sober glances fall. Much was their need though seamed with scars, two veterans of the Douglas Wars. Though gray priests were there, and each a blazing torch held high, you could not by their blaze descry the chapel's carving fair. Amid that dim and smoky light, checkering the silver moon be bright, a bishop by the altar stood, a noble lord of Douglas blood, with mitre sheen and rocket white, yet showed his meek and thoughtful eye but little pride of prelacy, more pleased that, in a barbarous age, he gave rude Scotland Virgil's page, than that beneath his rule he held the bishopric of fair Dunkeld. Beside him ancient Angus stood, doffed his furred gown and sable hood, o'er his huge form and visage pale he wore a cap and shirt of mail, and leaned his large and wrinkled hand upon the huge and sweeping brand which want of yore, in battle fray, his foeman's limbs to shred away, as wood-knife lops the sapling spray. He seemed as, from the tombs around, rising at judgment day, some giant Douglas may be found in all his old array. So pale his face, so huge his limb, so old his arms, his look so grim. Then at the altar Wilton kneels, and Clare the spurs pound on his heels, and think what next he must have felt at buckling of a falchion belt, and judge how Clare changed her hue while fastening to her lover's side a friend, which, 
though in danger tried, he once had found untrue. Then Douglas struck him with his blade. St. Michael and St. Andrew aid, I dub thee knight. Arise, Sir Ralph, De Wilton's heir. For king, for church, for lady fair, see that thou fight. And Bishop Gowan, as he rose, said, Wilton, grieve not for thy woes, disgrace and trouble. For he who honor best bestows may give thee double. De Wilton sobbed, for sob he must. Where'er I meet a Douglas, trust that Douglas is my brother. Nay, nay, old Inga said, not so. To Surrey's camp thou now must go, thy wrongs no longer smother. I have two sons in yonder field, and if thou meet'st them under shield, upon them bravely do thy worst, and foul fall him that blenches first. Not far advanced was morning day, when Marmion did his troop array to Surrey's camp to ride. He had safe conduct for his band, beneath the royal seal in hand, and Douglas gave a guide. The ancient earl, with stately grace, would Clara on her palfrey place, and whispered in an undertone, Let the hawk stoop, his prey is flown. The train from out the castle drew, but Marmion stopped to bid adieu. Thou, something I might plan, he said, of cold respect to stranger guest, sent hither by your king's behest, while in Ten Talons Towers I stayed. Part we in friendship from your land, and noble earl, receive my hand. But Douglas round him drew his cloak, folded his arms, and thus he spoke. My manors, halls, and bowers shall still be open at my sovereign's will, to each one whom he lists, howe'er unmeet to be the owner's peer. My castles are my kings alone, from turret to foundation stone. The hand of Douglas is his own, and never shall in friendly grasp the hand of such as Marmion clasp. Burned Marmion's swarthy cheeks like fire, and shook his very frame for ire, and this to me, he said, and for not for thy hoary beard, such hand as Marmion's had not spared to cleave the Douglas's head. And first I tell thee, haughty peer, he who does England's message here, although the meanest in her state, may well proud Angus be thy mate. And Douglas, more I tell thee here, even in thy pitch of pride, here in thy hold, thy vassals near, Nay, never look upon your lord and lay your hands upon your sword. I tell thee, thou art de deified, and if thou saidst I am not peer to any lord in Scotland here, lowland or highland, far or near, Lord Angus, thou hast lied. On the earl's cheek the flush of rage or came the ashen hue of age. Fierce he broke forth. And darest thou then to beard the lion in his den, the Douglas in his hall? And hopest thou hence unscathed to go? No, by St. Bride of Bothwell, no. Up, drawbridge, grooms, what warder ho? Let the portcullis fall. Lord Marmion turned, well was his need, and dashed the rowels in his steed. Like arrow through the archway sprung, the ponderous grate behind him rung. To pass there was such scanty room, the bars descending raised his plume. The steed along the drawbridge flies, just as it trembled on the rise, nor lighter does the swallow skim along smooth lake's level brim. And when Lord Marmion reached his band, he halts and turns with clenched hand, and shout of loud defiance pours, and shook his gauntlet at the towers. Horse, horse, the Douglas cried, and chase. But soon he reined his furious pace. A royal messenger he came, though most unworthy of the name. A letter forged, St. Jude to speed, did e'er such knights so foul a deed. At first in heart it liked me ill, when the king praised his clerkly skill. Thanks to St. Bothan, son of mine, save Gowan ne'er could pen a line. So swore I, and I swear it's... Let my boy bishop fret his fill, St. Mary mend my fiery mood. Old age ne'er cools the Douglas blood. I thought to slay him where he stood. Tis pity of him, too, he cried. Blood can he speak, and fairly ride. I warned him a warrior tried. With this his mandate he recalls, and slowly seeks his castle halls. The day in Marmion's journey wore, yet ere his passion's gust was o'er, they crossed the heights of San Moor. His troop more closely there he scanned, and missed the palmer from the band. Palm her not, young Blount did say, he parted at the peep of day. Good sooth, it was in strange array. In what array? said Marmion, quick. 
My lord, I ill can spell the trick, but all night long, with clink and bang, close to my couch did hammers clang. At dawn, the falling drawbridge rang, and from a loophole, while I peep, old Bell the cat came from the keep, wrapped in a gown of sables fair, as fearful of the morning air. Beneath, when that was blown aside, a rusty shirt of mail I spied. By Archibald, one in bloody work, against the Saracen and Turk. Last night it hung not in the hall, I thought some marvel would befall. And next I saw them saddled lead old Cheviot forth, this earl's best steed, a matchless horse, though something old, prompt to his paces, cool and bold. I heard the sheriff Scholto say, the earl did much the master pray to use him on the battle day. But he preferred, nay, Henry, cease, thou sworn horse courser, hold thy peace. Eustace, thou bearest a brain, I pray, what did Blount see at the break of day? In brief, my lord, we both descried, for then I stood by Henry's side, the palmer mount and outwards ride, upon the earl's own favorite steed. All sheathed he was in armor bright, and much resembled that same knight subdued by you in Cotswold fight. Lord Ingish wished him speed. The instant that Fitz Eustace spoke, a sudden light on Marmion broke. Ah, dastard fool to reason lost, he muttered. "'Twas not fay nor ghost I met upon the moonlight wold, "'but the living man of earthly mould. "'O oh, dotish blind and gross! "'Had I but fought as want, "'one thrust had laid de Wilton in the dust, "'my path no more to cross. "'How stand we now?' he told his tale to Douglas, "'and with some avail. "'Twas therefore gloomed his rugged brow. "'Will Surrey dare to entertain "'against Marmion charge disproved and vain?' Small risk of that, I trow, yet clear sharp questions must I shun, must separate Constance from the nun. Oh, what a tangled web we weave, when first we practice to deceive. A palmer, too, no wonder why I felt rebuked beneath his eye. I might have known there was but one whose look could quell Lord Marmion. Stung with these thoughts, he urged to speed his troop, and reached at eve the tweed, where Lennel's covenant closed their march, there now is left but one frail arch, yet mourn thou not as cells. Our time a fair exchange has made, hard by, in hospitable shade, a reverend pilgrimage dwells. Well worth the whole Bernadette de brood, that e'er wore sandal, frock, or hood. Yet did St. Bernard's abbot there give Marmion entertainment fair, and lodging for his train in Clare, next morn, the baron climbed the tower to view afar the Scottish power encamped on Flodden's edge. The white pavilions made a show, like remnants of the winter snow, along the dusky ridge. Long, Marmion looked. At length, his eye unusual movement might descry amid the shifting lines. The Scottish host drawn out appears, for flashing on the hedge of spears, the eastern sunbeam shines. Their front now deepening, now extending, their flank inclining, wheeling, bending, now drawing back and now descending. The skillful Marmion well could know they watched the motions of some foe who traversed on the plain below. Even so it was. From Flodden Ridge the Scots beheld the English host leave Barmore Wood, their evening post, and Heathful watched them as they crossed the till by Twistle Bridge. High sight it is, and haughty, while they dive into the deep defile. Beneath the cavern cliff they fall, Beneath the castle's airy wall, by rock, by oak, by hawthorn tree, troop after troop are disappearing. Troop after troop, their banners rearing, upon the eastern bank you see, still pouring down the rocky den where flows the sullen till. And rising from the dim wood glen, standards on standards, men on men, in slow succession still. And sweeping o'er the gothic arch, and pressing on in ceaseless march to gain the opposing hill. That morn, to many a trumpet clang, Twistle, thy rock's deep echo rang, And many a chief of birth and rank, St. Helen, at thy fountain drank. Thy hawthorn glade, which now we see In springtide bloom so lavishly, Had then from many an axis doom To give the marching columns room. And why stands Scotland idly now, Dark Flodden, on thy airy brow, Since England gains the past the while, And struggles through the deep defile? What checks the fiery soul of James? Why sits that champion of the Danes inactive on his steed, 
and seas between him and his land, between him and Tweed's southern strand, his host, Lord Surrey, lead? What avails the vain knight Aaron's brand? O oh, Douglas, for thy leading wand, fierce Randolph, for thy speed. O oh, for one hour of Wallace White, or well skid Bruce to rule the fight, and cry, St. Andrew, and our right! Another sight has seen that morn, from fate's dark book a leaf been torn, and Flodden had been bannock burn. The precious hour has passed in vain, and England's host has gained the plain, wheeling their march and circling still around the base of Flodden Hill. Ere yet the bands met Marmion's eye, Fitz Eustace shouted loud and high, Hark, hark, my lord, an English drum, and see ascending squadrons come between Tweed's river and the hill. Foot, horse, and cannon, hap, what hap, my bassinet to apprentice cap, Lord Surrey's o'er the till. Yet more, yet more, how far array they file from out the hawthorn shade, and sweep so gallant by. With all their banners bravely spread, and all their armor flashing high, St. George might waken from the dead, to see fair England's standards fly. Stint thy prate, quoth Blunt, thou's best, and listen to our lord's behest. With kindling brow, Lord Marmion said, this instant be our band arrayed, the river must be quickly crossed, that we may join Lord Surrey's host. If fight King James, as well, I trust, that fight he will, and fight he must, the Lady Clare behind our lines shall tarry while the battle joins. Himself he swift on horseback threw, scarce the abbot bade adieu. Far less would listen to his prayer to leave behind the helpless Clare. Down to the tweed his band he drew, and muttered as the flood they view, the pheasant in the falcon's claw, his scarce will yield to please a daw. Lord Angus made the abbot awe, so Clare shall bide with me. Then on that dangerous ford and deep, where to the tweed leaps eddies creep, he ventured desperately, and not a moment will he bide, till squire or groom before him ride. Headmost of all he stems the tide, and stems it gallantly. Eustace held Clare upon her horse, old Hubert led her rein. Stoutly they braved the current's course, and though far downward driven perforce, the southern bank they gain. Behind them straggling came to shore, as best they might, the train. Each o'er his head his yew bow bore, a caution not in vain. Deep knee that day that every string, by wet unharmed, should sharply ring. A moment when Lord Marmion stayed, and breathed his steed, his men arrayed, then forward moved his band. Until, Lord Surrey's rearguard won, he halted by a cross of stone, that, on a hillock standing lone, did all the fields command. Hence might they see the full array of either host for deadly fray. Their marshaled lines stretched east and west, and front and north and south, and distant solution passed from the loud cannon mouth. Not in the close successive rattle that breathed the voice of modern battle, but slow and far between. The hillock gained, Lord Marmion stayed. Here, by this cross, he gently said, you well may view the scene. Here shalt thou tarry, lovely Clare. Oh, think of Marmion in thy prayer. Thou wilt not? Well, no less my care shall watchful for thy wheel prepare. You, Blount and Eustace, are her guard, with ten picked archers of my train, with England if the day go hard, to Berwick speed amain. But if we conquer, cruel maid, my spoil shall at your feet be laid, when here we meet again. He waited not for answer there, and would not mark the maid's despair, nor heed the discontented look from either squire, but spurred amain and dashing through the battle plain his way to Surrey took. The good Lord Marmion, by my life, welcome to danger's hour. Short greeting serves in time of strife, thus I have ranged my power. Myself will rule this central host, so Stanley forts their right. My sons command the vowward post, with Brian Tunstall, stainless knight. Lord Dacre, with his horsemen light, shall be in rearward of the fight, and succor those that need it most. Now, gallant Marmion, well I know, would gladly to the vanguard go. Edmund, the admiral, Tunstall there, with thee their charge will blithely share. There fight thine own retainers too, beneath the burg, thy steward true. Thanks, noble Surrey, Marmion said, nor farther greeting there he paid, but parting like a thunderbolt, first in the vanguard made a halt, where such a shout there rose of Marmion, Marmion, that the cry of Flodden Mountain shrilling high startled the Scottish foes. 
Blount and Fitz Eustace rested still with Lady Clare upon the hill, on which, for far the day was spent, the western sunbeams now were bent. The cry they heard, its meaning knew, could plain their distant comrades' view. Sadly to Blount did Eustace say, unworthy office here to stay. No hope of gilded spurs today, but see, look upon Flodden bent the Scottish foe has fired his tent. And sudden, as he spoke, from the sharp ridges of the hill, all downward to the banks of Till, was wreathed in sable smoke. Volumed and fast, and rolling far, the cloud enveloped Scotland's war, as down the hill they broke. Nor martial shout, nor minstrel tone, announced their march, their tread alone, at times one morning trumpet blown, at times a stifled hum, told England from his mountain throne King James did rushing come. Scarce could they hear or see their foes until at weapon point they close. They close in clouds of smoke and dust with sword sway and with glasses thrust. And such a yell was there of sudden and portentous birth as if men fought upon the earth and fiends in upper air. Oh, life and death were in the shout, recoil and rally, charge and rout, and triumph and despair. Long looked the ancient squires, their eye could in darkness not descry. At length, the freshening western blast aside the shroud of battle cast, and first the ridge of mingled spears above the brightening cloud appears, and in the smoke the pennons flew, as in the storm the white sea mew, then marked they, dashing broad and far, the broken billows of the war, and plumed crests of chieftains brave, floating like foam upon the wave. But not distinct they see, wide ranged the battle on the plain, spears shook and falchions flashed amain, Fell England's arrow fight like rain. Crests rose and stooped and rose again, wild and disorderly. Amid the scene of tumult, high they saw Lord Marmion's falcon fly, and stainless Tunstall's banner white, and Edmund Howard's lion bright, still bear them bravely in the fight. Although against them come of gallant Gordon's many a one, and many a stubborn Benknock men, and many a rugged border clan, with Huntley and with home. Far on the left, unseen the while, Stanley broke Lennox and Argyle, though there was the western mountaineer, rushed with bare bosom on the spear and flung the feeble targe aside, and with both hands the broadsword plied. Twas vain, but fortune on the right with fickle smile cheered Scotland's fight. Then fell that spotless banner white, the Howard's lion fell. Yet still Lord Marmion's falcon flew with wavering flight, while fiercer grew around the battle yell. The border slogan rent the sky. A home, a Gordon, was the cry. Loud were the clanging blows. Advanced, forced back, now low, now high, the pennon sunk and rose. As bends the bark's nest in the gale, when rent our rigging, shrouds and sail, it wavered mid the foes. No longer blount the view could bear. By heaven and all the saints, I swear I will not see it lost. Fitz Eustace, you with Lady Clare, may bid your beads and patter prayer. I gallop to the host. And to the fray he rode amain, followed by all the archer train. The fiery youth, with desperate charge, made for a space an opening large. The rescued banner rose, but darkly closed the war around. Like pine tree rooted from the ground, it sank among the foes. Then Eustace mounted too, yet stayed, as loath to leave the helpless maid. When fast as shaft can fly, blood shot his eyes, his nostrils spread, the loose rein dangling from his head, housing and saddle bloody red, Lord Marmion's steed rushed by, and Eustace, maddening at the sight, a look and sign to Clara cast, to mark he would return in haste, then plunge into the fight. Ask me not what the maiden feels, left in that dreadful hour alone. Perchance her reason stoops or reels, Perchance a courage, not her own, braces her mind to desperate tone. The scattered van of England's wheels, she only said, as loud in air, the tumult rolled. Is Wilton there? They fly, or maddened by despair, fight but to die. Is Wilton there? With that, straight up the hill there rode two horsemen drenched with gore, and in their arms a helpless load, a wounded knight they bore. His hands still braid, strained the broken brand. His arms were smeared with blood and sand. Dragged from among the horse's feet, with dinted shield and helmet beat, the falcon crest and plumage gone. Can that be haughty Marmion? 
young Blount, his armor did unlace, and gazing on his ghostly face, said, By St. George, he's gone. That spear wound has our master sped, and see the deep cut on his head. Good night to Marmion. Unnurtured Blount, thou bridling cease, he opens his eyes, said Eustace. Peace. When doffed his cask, he felt free air, around again Marmion wildly stare. Where's Harry Blount? Fitz Eustace, where? Linger ye here, ye hearts of hair. Redeem my pennon, charge again. Cry, Marmion to the rescue, vain. Last of my race on battle plain, that shout shall ne'er be heard again. Yet my last thought is England's. Fly to Dacker, bear my signet ring. Tell him his squadron's up to bring. Fitz Eustace, to Lord Surrey, high. Tunstall lies dead upon the field. His lifeblood stains the spotless shield. Edmund is down, my life is reft, the admiral alone is left. Let Stanley charge with spur of fire, with Chester charge and Lancashire, fall upon Scotland's central host, or victory, and England's lost. Must I bid twice? Hence, varlets, fly, leave Marmion here alone to die. They parted, and alone he lay. Clare drew her su- from her the sight away, till pain wrung forth a lowly moan, and half he murmured, is there none of my halls have nursed, page, squire, or groom, one cup to bring of blessed water from the spring to slake my dying thirst? O woman, in our hours of ease, uncertain, coy, and hard to please, and variable as the shade by the light quivering aspen made, when pain and anguish wring the brow, a ministering angel thou, scarce were the piteous accents said, when, with the baron's cask, the maid to the nigh streamlet ran, Forgot were hatred, wrongs, and fears, the plaintive voice alone she hears, sees but the dying man. She stooped her by the runnel's side, but in abhorrence backwards drew, for, oozing from the mountain side, where raged the war, a dark red tide was curdling in the streamlet blue. Where shall she turn? Behold her mark a little fountain cell, where water, clear as diamond spark, in a stone basin fell. Above, some half-worn letters say, Drink, weary pilgrim, drink and pray, For the kind soul of Sybil Gray, Who built this cross and well. She filled the helm, and back she hide, And with surprise and joy espied, A monk supporting Marmion's head, A pious man, who duty brought To dubious verge of battle fought, The shrieve, the dying, the bless the dead. Drink deep, Lord Marmion of the wave, And as she stooped his brow to lave, is it the hand of Clare, he said, or injured Constance bathes my head? Then, as remembrance rose, speak not to me of shrift of prayer. I must redress her woes. Short space, few words are mine to spare. Forgive and listen, gentle Clare. Alas, she said, the while, oh, think of your immortal weal. In vain for Constance is your zeal. She died at Holy Isle. Lord Marmion started from the ground, as light as if he felt no wound, though in the action burst the tide in torrents from his wounded side. Then it was the truth, he said. I knew that the dark presage must be true. I would the fiend, to whom belongs the vengeance due to all her wrongs, would spare me but a day. For wasting flower and dying groan, and priest slain on the altar stone might bribe him for delay. It may not be, this dizzy trance, curse on yon base Maud Rodder's lance, and doubly cursed my falling brand. A sinful heart makes feeble hand. Then, fainting down on the earth, he sunk, supported by the trembling monk. With fruitless labor, Clara bound, and strove to stanch the gusting wound. The monk, with unavailing cares, exhausted all the church's prayers. Ever, he said, that close and near a lady's voice was in his ear, and that the priest he could not hear, for that she ever sung. In the lost battle, borne down by the flying, where mingles wars rattle with groans of the dying. So the notes rung. Avoid thee, fiend, with cruel hand, shake not the dying sinner's hand. O look, my son, upon yon sign of the Redeemer's grace divine. O think on faith and bliss. By many a deathbed I have been, and many a sinner's parting seen, but never aught like this. The war that for a space did fail, now trebly thundering swelled the gale, and Stanley was the cry. A light on Marmion's visage spread, and fired his gazing eye. With dying hand above his head, he shook the fragment of his blade and shouted, Victory! Charge, Chester, charge! On, Stanley, on! were the last words of Marmion. 
By this, though deep the evening fell, still rose the battle's deadly swell, for still the Scots around their king unbroken fought in desperate ring. Where's now their victor forward ring? Where Huntley and where home? Oh, for that blast of dreaded horn, on Fonterry Bon, echoes born, that way to Charles did come. When Roland brave, and Oliver, and every paladin and peer, on Roncesvalles to hide. Such blasts might warn them, not in vain, to quit the plunder of the slain, and turn the doubtful day again, while yet on Flodden's side. Afar the royal standard flies, and round it toils and bleeds and dies our Caledonian pride. In vain the wish for far away, while spoil and havoc mark their way, near Sibyl's cross the plunderers stray. O lady, cried the monk, away, and placed her on her steed, and led her to the chapel fair of Tilmouth upon Tweed. There all the night they spent in prayer, and at the dawn of morning there she met her kinsman, Lord Fitzclair. But as they left the darkening heath, more desperate grew the strife of death. The English shafts and volleys hailed, in headlong charge their horse assailed. Front, flank, and rear the squadrons sweep to break the Scottish circle deep that fought around their king. But yet, though thick the shafts were snow, though charging knights like whirlwinds go, though bilemen ply the ghastly blow, unbroken was the ring. The stubborn spearmen still made good their dark impenetrable wood, each stepping where his comrades stood the instant that he fell. No thought was there of dastard flight, linked in the serried phalanx tight. Groom fought like noble, squire like knight, as fearlessly and well, till utter darkness closed her wing o'er their thin host and wounded king. Then skillful Surrey's sage commands led back from strife his shattered bands, and from the charge they drew, as mountain waves from wasted lands sweep back to ocean blue. Then did their loss his foemen know, their king, their lords, their mightiest low, they melted from the fields as snow, when streams are swollen, and south winds blow, dissolves in silent dew. Tweed's echoes heard the ceaseless plash, while many a broken band disordered through her currents dash to gain the Scottish land, to town and tower, to down and dale, to tell Rod Blodden's dismal tale, and raise the universal wail. Tradition, legend, tune, and song shall many an age that wail prolong. Still from the sire the sun shall hear of the stern strife and carnage drear of Flodden's fatal field, where shivered was fair Scotland's spear and broken was her shield. Day dawns upon the mountain side. There, Scotland, lay thy bravest pride. Chiefs, knights, and nobles, many a one. The sad survivors are all gone. View not that corpse mistrustfully, defaced and mangled though it be. Nor to yon border castle high, look northward with upbraiding eye. Nor cherish hope in vain, that, journeying far on foreign strand, the royal pilgrim to his land may yet return again. He saw the wreck his rashness wrought. Reckless of life, he desperate fought, and fell on Flodden Plain. And while in death his trusty brand, firm clenched within his manly hand, beseemed the monarch slain. But, oh, how changed is yon blithe night! Gladly I turn me from the sight unto my tale again. Short is my tale. Fitz Eustace Care, a pierced and mangled body, bare to moated Lishfield's lofty pile. And there, beneath the southern isle, a tomb with Gothic sculpture fair, did long Lord Marmion's image bear. Now vainly for its sight you look, t'was leveled when fanatic brook the fair cathedral stormed and took. But thanks to heaven and good Saint Chad, a guerdon met the spoiler had. There erst was Marshal Marmion found, his feet upon a couchant hound, his hands to heaven upraised, and all around, on scutcheon rich and tablet carved and fretted niche, his arms and feet were blazed. And yet, Though all was carved so fair, and priests for Marmion breathed the prayer, the last Lord Marmion lay not there. From Ettrick Woods a peasant swain followed his lord to Flodden Plain, on of those flowers whom plaintive lay in Scotland mourns as weed away. Sore wounded, Sybil's cross he spied, and dragged him to its foot and died. And close by the noble Marmion's side, the spoilers stripped and gashed the slain, and thus their corpses were mistaken. And thus in the proud baron's tomb, the lowly woodsman took the room. Less easy task it were to show Lord Marmion's nameless grave and low. They dug his grave e'en where he lay, but every mark is gone. 
Time's wasting hand has done away the simple cross of Sybil Gray and broke her font of stone. But yet from out the little hill oozes the slender springlet still, oft halts the stranger there. For thence may best his curious eye the memorable field descry, and shepherd boys repair to seek the water flag and rush, and rest them by the hazel bush, and plait their garlands fair. Nor dreams they sit upon the grave that holds the bones of Marmion brave, when thou shalt find the little hill with thy heart commune, and be still. If ever, in temptation strong, thou left the right path for the wrong, if ever devious step thus trod, still led thee farther from the road, dread thou to speak presumptuous doom on noble Marmion's lowly tomb, but say he died a gallant knight, with sword in hand, for England's right. I do not rhyme to that dull elf, who cannot image to himself, that all through Flodden's dismal night, Wilton was foremost in the fight, that... When brave Surrey's steed was slain, twas Wilton mounted him again. Twas Wilton's brand that deepest hewed amid the spearman's stubborn wood. Unnamed by Holland shed or hall, he was the living soul of all. That, after fight, his faith made plain, he won his rank and lands again, and charged his own paternal shield with bearings won on Flodden Field. Nor sing I to that simple maid, to whom it must in terms be said, that king and kinsman did agree to bless fair Clara's constancy, who cannot, unless I relate, paint to her mind the bridal state, that Wolsey's voice the blessing spoke, more, Sands and Denny passed the joke, that bluff King Hal the curtain drew, and Catherine's hand the stocking threw, and afterwards, for many a day, that it was held enough to say, in blessing to a wedded pair, Love thy like Wilton, and like Claire.